You expect the next 10 years to have lower returns in the equity markets than the last 10? It doesn't yes. give us an idea why? The answer is yes. Um, I think that most likely what we're ha going to have is a period of stagflation. In the late 1980s, fueled by excess leverage and speculation, Japan's economic miracle came to a sudden halt. To deflate this speculation and to keep inflation in check, the Bank of Japan desperately tries to raise interbank lending rates in the late 1980s with extreme aggression. This is what happened. Inflation is much too high, and we understand the hardship it is causing, and we're moving expeditiously to bring it back down. From the standpoint of our congressional mandate to promote maximum employment and price stability, the current picture is plain to see. The labor market is extremely tight, and inflation is much too high. Against this backdrop, today the FOMC raised its policy interest rate by a half percentage point and anticipates that ongoing increases in the target rate for the federal funds rate will be appropriate. In addition, we are beginning the process of significantly reducing the size of our balance sheet. In the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, experts across varying fields of expertise called for a lost decade of progress. From the growth of unstable nations, to the stock market, to developmental aid, and emerging economies, this exogenous shock from the pandemic created a ripple in the way we all did business. This led to a response never seen before play out on the international stage. The U.S. added more than $13 trillion to its money supply. These external factors set the conditions for a U.S. economy that was vulnerable to overinflated asset prices, and worse yet, the inevitable move from the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates in an attempt to control inflation. We're in very uncharted waters. We have, nobody has gotten by with the kind of money printing we're doing now for a very extended period without some trouble. And I, I think we're, we're very near the edge of playing with fire. This is the record of historical asset bubbles starting from 1977. Gold in the 1980s, then Japan's lost decade, followed by Thailand, then tech, the US housing bubble, which caused the Great Recession, China, biotech, and now ARK Innovation and Bitcoin. Make no mistake, we're living through the aftermath of an asset bubble that was extreme and predictable. This is a chart of the S&P 500. If we draw only the most significant trend lines on the chart, you'll see that the final trend still has a lot of room to go before we resolve the trend, let alone if the trend actually breaks as seen in the previous two instances. And if we look at the CAPE ratio, the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio for the entire S&P, we see here that we are only ever more asset rich one previous time in history. They produced a lot of debt and gave out a lot of money. And so everybody's got money and it's also very easy to borrow money to buy things. And as a result, if you create much more buying power than you create goods and services, you've got a lot much more inflation. And the Federal Reserve has been behind the curve, slower to tighten monetary policy. And as a result, we're now starting to see the rise in interest rates to be able to deal with that. As that happens, all assets compete with each other. So now that free money is still gonna be cheap money, but it's going to be um, a bit higher. So interest rates, let's say bond yields, have gone up about 
Now you take that and you adjust, everything is the present value of future cash flows, but it means that that interest rate goes up a percent. That means all the other assets have to adjust. We're in a process of making that kind of adjustment. That means the days that we've had before, the easy days where they dump money on you and you don't have much inflation and you don't have much tightness, those are past. And now we're in a different kind of part of the cycle. In a 2018 interview, Carl Icahn famously said, don't confuse brains with a bull market. While there are an infinite number of strategies that can help retail investors capture alpha in all kinds of markets, one thing is becoming more clear. This is no longer a bull market. Given that, this is the time where whatever principles in investing you prescribe to will ultimately be challenged. I think three things have happened. You know, one is, I think that there is an oversensitivity to think the cycle's ending because of age. And- Because of how long markets seem to have been going up. Yes, because 10 years of an expansion, longest in history, and almost everyone thinks we have to be late cycle as a consequence. Right, which you could understand. Yes, it makes sense, but right. we have two fairly bulletproof measures of cycle, which is employed to population ratio and in, in private investment to GDP spend. And they're not saying that? They're mid-cycle, yeah. Okay. All right. um, the second is I think people tend to think the center of gravity of growth in the world is China, which was true for the last 20 years. But our work is showing that it's actually going to be the U.S. the next 20. Wow. So we have a huge structural shift taking place. China might actually be Japan in the next 20 years. And, and a lot of this is coming from demography, you're saying? Yeah, demography. And, and if you look at wealth accumulation or value capture, the U.S. has captured $100 trillion of household wealth, which is one third of global wealth. In a, and, and they've actually widened their lead. In the next 20 years, I think U.S. might control over 50% of global wealth. Okay, so what you're saying is not to just take at face value these prognostications that we're entering into the Chinese decade or the Chinese century um, simply because of their size catching up to ours, that there are more important considerations. Yeah, that's right. So China is going to be the second most important economy. But in the next 10 years, the U.S. is clearly the most important. There's the millennials inheriting... $75 trillion of wealth. And building their own. Building their own. Right. They're about to hit their 30 to 50 range, which means they're going to be buying a lot of houses. No other country that's developed except for India is going to see this. So there's only two regions that are going to see this sort of hyper growth, US and India. And the third is, I think there's a lot of people that want a recession because they either want to change the White House or their long bonds. And so we think there's recession mania. You know, people are carrying 2008 hammers looking for 2008 nails. Hey, what's up, y'all? Uh, even though this is a highly curated video, I didn't want to leave you without any real Kenny talk or kind of my thoughts on this matter. So the reason I made this video is because, yes, I am concerned that we might have a little bit of a falling off here in terms of where we could be uh, in the next 10 years. But the both pundits make very good kind of arguments. So Tom Lee's argument is very sound as well. You know, the data does prove that we have a lot of demographic tailwinds. We have an expanding generational cohort right now that is going into their most premium prime leverage years. GDP is still very strong. The engine is looking real strong on the economy. That said, you know, if you just take a look at the charts, you look at the data and you kind of dissect what's happened previously, the one thing I'll say is we just don't know what this hangover is going to look like. We have no idea what that Fed uh, kind of printing of those trillions of dollars is going to do to our economy. And we just don't know what the hangover really looks like yet. Um, we've never taken this beer down. And so this will be the first time we experiment and figure out if this is really sustainable or if we need to indeed take some tough medicine uh, to get us out of this. So that's kind of where I'm at. The reason I made this video again is, you know, I'm thinking about it too, but you know, if you're wondering what you're supposed to be doing, hey, you know, you have that long-term investment account that we always talk about. You don't touch that. Uh, you just keep putting that money in there and saving for the rainy day. Keep buying these dips. Uh, and in your trading account, yeah, I mean, you <laughs> go ahead and uh, short every living, breathing zombie company there is and uh, we'll be just fine. Anyways, thanks for watching and we will see you tomorrow.